So we're continuing to look at the church, and we're concluding this month's series where we've been looking at vision and looking at um, the church and things like that, and we're concluding that this morning. As next week will be that special event, that special morning, uh, a reach service, looking at leadership and um, serving well and things like that. So um, we're going to conclude this now, and then next month we're going to be starting a series looking at a, a Bible book, which is going to be First Samuel. So we're going to look at that book, and we're going to dive into that. But So we're concluding this today, church and vision and what it's all about. And last week, we thought about the whole fact that as the church gathered and scattered, um, what does that mean for us? Who are we, and what are we doing here? What is the purpose of our gatherings? What is the purpose of us talking about church and, and, and trying to be the church in our communities? And the two things we looked at last week were we are a kingdom of priests, so we are all called to be that in the world. We are part of something that God himself is building. So we're a kingdom of priests, and we're also members of a body, of the body of Christ. And you would have found in your bulletin this morning, all the services and sermons and everything are now going to be on a YouTube channel, and there's going to be live streaming and all that sort of thing. So if you have missed those um, and missed the last few weeks, I would encourage you to get them and be encouraged by them. And this week, I want to look at a reality and a truth that's a, as incredible as the one we looked at last week. And it's not incredible because I am, it's incredible because of what God's Word actually says. And if we can grasp something off this, it will be revolutionary for our lives. I wholly and truly believe that. So if you've got a Bible with you, I would love you to go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, please. That would be super. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We know that Corinthians is written to, to a, a, a fledgling church that are in the midst of a very immoral climate and a very diverse situation. And Paul, who had a real heart for this church, is going to say some challenging things with the end goal in mind to get these believers to understand who they are. That's really the crux of the Corinthian letter. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. So let's read there. Now, remember, there's some challenging things here, but this is written by a man who loved these people dearly. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? And what he's saying is, this is a very earthy way to live. You have problems, you have this and you have that, so I can't really talk to you the way I want to because you're struggling and you're dealing with these really, really simple things. Are you not just behaving like everybody else? That's really what he's saying. And let's go on to verse 5. What, after all, is Apollos? What after all, or sorry, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building." By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day of Jesus will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one only escaping through the flames. And then it's this verse that he's working towards. It's this reality that he's building up to, and it's this reality that I want to talk about this morning. Don't you know that you yourselves are, are God's temple, and that the Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. 
Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And I pray, spirit of truth, would you make this truth real to our hearts as we look at it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a, a church that's struggling with difficult things or different things. They're struggling with who they like better as leaders. They're arguing about what teacher's better and is this one better and I'm following Paul and I'm with Apollos and I'm with this person and that person. And they're walking this path. They're struggling with things and Paul is wanting them to get this truth into their hearts, getting to grips with what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be the church don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? This is what I want to talk to you this morning about. You together are the dwelling place of Almighty God. You together are the dwelling place of Almighty God. When we meet like this, God is here. He is in the gathering of His people. I wonder how many of us got up this morning with this in mind. I wonder how many of us were thinking along those terms whenever we got changed this morning, um, kicked the cat, kicked the kids out, of, out the door. I wonder how that was going on in your mind. What were you thinking? Or was it a kind of, let's get up at the last minute, rush here and make sure I'm looking my best and along those terms? Because the reality is very much that's our mindset. But the truth is when we gather like this, God is here. God himself is here when we gather as the church. This idea is firmly rooted in Scripture and in the New Testament in particular as to what it means to be the church. And it's relevant for us today as it was for them in, the, in these days. The gathered together people of God form the dwelling place of God. Something unique and special is happening when God's people gather. See, we're not just a club. We're not just a place where you come to meet friends and different ministries go on and, oh, that was a lovely wee day in church. We are the dwelling place of God. And it should change how we think about things together, whether that's in secret churches, in persecuted places, in silence, whether that's in large ornate buildings up and down this country and in the Western world, the gathered people of God are the, is the dwelling place of God. Now, you don't need me to tell you that, but I'm going to anyway, and I have done already, because you know moments in your life when you rushed out to church at the last minute, when you were dragged out to church at the last minute, when you could barely lift your head off your pillow, and you made it into here, and the songs that were sung just went over your head, the communion service and all that was going on there you couldn't engage with, the preacher was rubbish, but yet your life was changed from the inside out because God was here and you met with God and God did something in your heart that changed your outlook as you left this place. So you know that something special is happening over and above and beyond all the different voices that you're hearing when you're here. Do you not know that you yourselves are the God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Many people and we Pentecostals are the worst at this, so we can do this this morning. We approach the church gathering and the idea that God is dwelling with his people as if it's a really difficult thing to get God to be here. We use language that shows our hearts where we are nearly in a state of pleading or begging, God, come, Lord. And we use that phrase. We all use that. I use that phrase. Come, Lord. And we're nearly begging some distant deity to come and be close to us. And sometimes, and we've all experienced this, sometimes we end up in a bit of a frenzy. And we remind ourselves of that story when Elijah stood on the top of the mountain with the prophets of a false god. And they were screaming and they were yelling and they were even cutting themselves, begging this deity to show up. And what does Elijah do? God, reveal yourself so that they all know that you're the one true God. And God answers in dramatic, fire fashion in that moment. Folks, we need to remind ourselves that this God who is present in our midst, he actually wants to be here. He, it's his desire to be here. It's not about us begging and pleading with him as if he's disinterested. He wants to be where his people are. It's his heart and his desire. And sometimes we think that he's disinterested in us. 
that he couldn't care less, that he's got more things to do. Folks, his ultimate desire is to be with his people and with his creation. That's his heart. That's what he wants. And sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit in terms, and I know in Scripture we see this image as a, of a dove coming down and resting on Jesus, but Holy Spirit is not a skittish dove who gets put off when things are a bit messy. He's not like that. He's not like my dad kept pigeons for years and still does racing pigeons, and they are sent to some country, and then they fly back, and whenever ones make it back first, well, they're the winners. <clears throat> on a Saturday afternoon when those birds are flying back, I was told to get out of the way because if I was making any noise or playing football, I would be chasing the birds away because they were, they were a bit frightened. The only way to get them in was give them food or starve them so they'd be really hungry or have their mates in the, in the, um, the shed. Folks, the Holy Spirit is not a timid, terrified dove who's going to fly off whenever you make a noise or make a sound. Our God has dirty hands. He's a God who rolls his sleeves up and gets stuck in. We see it in creation, and we see it in redemption. If your life is a mess, that's, your life is exactly where God wants to be. If you're broken, if you're, you feel filthy, if you feel dirty, the Father's arms are open wide. The picture we see of God in Scripture is not a God who just wants to keep himself clean and stay out of the mess. It's a God who jumps right in. It's of a father who rolls up his garment to run to his son who's been living in the fields and living with the pigs. And it's not, oh, get yourself cleaned up, son, and then come and see us for dinner. He embraces him. It's messy. It's dirty. The Holy Spirit is just like that. If you feel you're not worthy, if you feel you're dirty, if you feel you're not clean enough to have God come and be with you, he sends you you have no idea of the messes and the length I will go to to be with my creation. You have no idea. And folks, we don't. So he wants to be here. The creator has dirty hands. We see it in creation. We see it in redemption. And the whole purpose of everything, the whole purpose of what we celebrated this morning, Jesus' broken body, his shed blood, the crushing weight of sin that he carried onto the cross and was nailed to the cross for. The whole purpose of all of that is so that God can be with you and so that you can be with him. That's his whole purpose. That's what the whole restoration project is about from Genesis to Revelation. That's what he is doing to bring a people to be where he is and with him. It has, that's where the story ends. The Father has a desire to be here. I grew up in a, a community that had, how do I be sensitive with this? I grew up in a community that had lots of children, sons and daughters who had multiple parents involved, parental involvement. They had one biological parent, obviously, but they had lots of dads and moms coming and going from the same household where you could, on a every day, see a boy who wasn't sure what one of the five partners his mom had were actually his dad, where he would go running up in the street and say, Dad, and the dad would want nothing to do with him because that wasn't really his dad. Or even if it was his dad, he didn't want anything to do with him anyway. And see, when I witnessed those stories firsthand, it was heartbreaking. There's nothing more heartbreaking than a parent that keeps their children at a distance, whether that be for too busy with work, running the business, whether that be other interests or whatever it is, when a parent or a father in particular has no time for his children, it's one of the most heartbreaking things ever. The trouble with us as Christians, we live feeling like our father has no time for us and that he doesn't want to be with us. And that's equally as heartbreaking because our father God has gone to the ultimate lengths to show that he loves us enough to want to be with us to show that he understands, that he cares, that he wants to dwell where his people are. Folks, we need to get this right, and we need to understand this. The ultimate aim of God is to be with his people. If you've got your Bible, I want to go to Revelation 21. Well-known passages of Scripture, and we're only going to read a few verses from here, because we have heard this so many times, but for so many of us, 
we're getting the, we just get the picture that, oh, it's going to be really nice when God comes and, do you know, when we're in the new heaven and new earth, like, that's going to be lovely. The streets are going to be beautiful. The place is going to be really nice. And when we hear these verses, that's what we're immediately thinking of. But what is actually being said, it's not that the streets are nice, not that the building's nice, but actually this truth that's revealed in these verses. Revelation 21, verse 1, John is having this revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth so this is right at the very end. This is where it's all going to end. This is what's going to be whenever everything else is gone. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, and here's the thing, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. At the end of it all, what God is looking to do is to dwell permanently with his people. When there's no sin, there's no brokenness, there's no hurt, there's no shame, whenever we can dwell in that place with God, that's what God is wanting to do. That's his ultimate aim. That's what we're looking forward to. Are you looking forward to that? I am, when he is the center of it all, all the time, when he is all that we see, now we get a foretaste, now we have glimpses and moments, but then that will be all that there is, and it will be incredible. Can I give you a short history lesson? Not in 20 seconds, unfortunately, I can't do it in 20 seconds, maybe just a wee bit longer. This has always been God's desire to dwell in the midst of his people. In Scripture and in history, we see there were significant places and significant times where God chose to make His presence felt and known. They were the places where heaven and earth met, where heaven touched earth, the go-between place, the place where God was meeting with people right from the very beginning. The Garden of Eden, when we think about it, we think of story, our Sunday school story, we think, oh, it was a lovely garden. Do you know Adam just kicking about and enjoying the, the animals, naming them? Do you know everything was great and it was really lovely? The garden is a temple where God meets with his people. Do you remember what happened when he came down and he said, where are you? Why did he say that? Because that was the place where he met with his creation. Where have you gone? Whenever Adam heard the voice of God walking in the cool of the day, that's just another way of putting God was walking in the garden, and Adam should have been walking with him, but Adam had hid. The, the Garden of Eden is a picture of this dwelling place, and we know what will be at the end. It'll be a new garden. It'll be the new heaven and the new earth where this will happen again. But at the very beginning, this is what God's design was and desire was. He wanted to be with his people, and he wanted them to be with him. So the Garden of Eden is a temple. It's a meeting place. One of the first things that God did after he called the slaves out of Egypt, what did he do? He established a tabernacle in the wilderness, a meeting place where he could meet with his people. And he gave Moses the blueprint for it. This is how it's going to be built. These are the dimensions. This is the way I want it set up. Why was that? Was it just so they could have a building? No, it was so that his people could meet with him. It was so that these slaves could actually enjoy the fact and the reality of why he had rescued them from slavery in the first place. It was so that they could come out and worship him and know him and walk with him and enjoy him. And if you know your Old Testament history and you have one of those Bibles that gives you the map and the descriptions, the dwelling place of God in the wilderness was that the tribes would be on the outskirts and the dwelling place of God would be right in the center. So they didn't have to go anywhere. They had just got out of their tents and look, and there was the dwelling place. That was the purpose. That was what he called them out for. He was their God. They were his people. Whenever the Israelites crossed over out of the wilderness, out of the wanderings into the promised land, when they walked across the Jordan, one of the first things that they did when they had done that was establish a semi-permanent structure, a tabernacle at Shiloh. Now, when we're looking at 1 Samuel, we'll find out about this tabernacle, but with, when the time of Eli the prophet and before Samuel was born, the people of God had a tabernacle there, semi-permanent structure, where people like Hannah could go and pray about the fact that she couldn't have children. That was the place where the people of God could meet with God, and they did. They traveled from near and far to be where the dwelling place of God was. 
And then, I think we looked at this at the start of the month, the next temple to come along after that was the Temple of Solomon. Glorious in splendor, overlaid with gold, all these great things. But really, the glory of that temple was the fact that whenever Solomon prayed to dedicate that temple, the presence of God came down and filled the temple with such weight of God's glory that the priest couldn't even stay in there. They had to get out. And that was the reality of that place and time. Now, when I'm saying all that and why the history lesson, and some of you are like, Bill, okay, enough's enough. I'm saying that to say that the purpose of God has always been to dwell with his people, just in case you don't believe me. All these occasions, all these buildings, all these places at all these times, always instituted by God, were because God wanted to be with his people. And then probably most significant of all, Jesus steps onto the scene and he says, the kingdom of God has come near you. The reality of God has come close to you. Born in a stable, born in obscurity, born in the dirt, walking amongst the ordinary people. The kingdom of God has come near you. And what did he say about himself? Whenever the, they were going to stone him and they wanted to kill him, and in fact they did in the end, because he said, tear down this temple, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. And they thought that he was talking about the, the structure that existed, but he was actually talking about himself. He was the temple, the spirit in him without measure, the face of the Father being revealed to the people, the place where heaven and earth met, God showing people that he wanted to be with them. The ultimate example, there's so much more in that. The purpose of God, as we move on, the purpose of God leaving his Holy Spirit with us, the significance of that, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So the gathered body of Christ, now today, not bricks and mortar, but actually us together. We are that dwelling place that we've seen throughout history is what God desires and what he wants. Please, folks, when you come to church, be more conscious of the reality that when we dwell, God is here. Be more aware of that. Be more thankful for that. Don't miss that. If all we do is come to church and go through the motions, then we're missing the reality for why we're even called together in the first place. We're missing something so, so important. We are a habitation for God and his glory. And that's what it's all about. That's why we started our service by singing, be the center of it all. Be the center of your church. Nothing else matters. That's the key. That's what we want. That's what we long for. So that the glory of God would be revealed to us and then be revealed beyond these walls. Practicalities. Because you're maybe thinking, Bill, when I come to church, it's not always that way. I'm not really always too sure of the reality of God in our midst. But let me just tell you a couple of, or give you a couple of examples to encourage you with that. Jacob, one of the patriarchs that God had called, <coughs> we know that Jacob was a bit of a twister, a bit of a cheat manipulated his brother a few times. And the most significant of those times was when he stole his brother's birthright because his mom told him to, dressed up in a load of hair, went in before his blind father, said, Father, I'm Esau, the one that you love. Here's the food. Give me the blessing. That's a short way of, of, of condensing it down. Um, but that's what he did. When Jacob had to run away from home because his brother was going to kill him, Jacob headed towards his family, which was in a bit of a, a, bit of a journey, a bit of a trek. But he crossed through a piece of land one night, and he needed to lie down, put a stone under his head for a pillow, because he was hard, a hard man like that. He put a stone down, lay on it that night. And in the middle of the night, he had a vision, and he experienced God, and God spoke to him. And one of the phrases that Jacob uses at the end of that whole experience is, surely God was in this place, and I was not aware of it. It's possible when you meet in a place where God is, that you don't even tangibly feel anything. It's possible that God does a work in your heart whenever your outward senses don't really feel anything. One of my most significant moments was in this building Alistair called for us to come forward and write down on a piece of paper, I think it was one New Year's Day, something that we wanted God to work in, a situation, and um, left a bucket at the front. And I, I must be honest, I, sometimes when that happens, I'm like, God, I can't ask you about this again. I've asked you hundreds of times about this. 
and I'm tired. And if I go forward here and I fill this in and I offer this prayer to you and you don't answer me, it's going to be difficult again. I don't know many of you have ever felt like that, but I felt like that that morning. I wasn't especially feeling spiritual, didn't really engage in the worship that morning, tried to, but didn't feel anything. I mean, it's a lesson that we never go by our feelings. But that morning, I filled out something on a piece of paper that I had walked with and struggled with probably for about 20 years of my life and threw it into the bucket. Felt exactly the same leaving this building. But from that moment, something happened. Something happened where God just took that away from my life and off my life. And I'm and I totally being totally truthful. I didn't feel that. But... In a world where feelings are elevated to a much higher position than they should be, that was a big shock to me. But folks, we are people who walk by faith and not by sight. We walk in what we know to be true and not in what we feel. Because if we go by our feelings, we are in real trouble. And we will be in real trouble. So sometimes it can be surely God was in this place and I was not aware of it. But the reality is that he's still here. Other times, and this is where all you Pentecostals get excited, other times, it's like Moses, when Moses sees the burning bush and he steps over near it and he takes off his sandals, off his feet, because he knows that it's holy ground and God has told him that it is. Or it can be when the glory of God fills his tabernacle to such a degree that everything just stops, where we just, we just, we just need to stop. There was a moment this morning, even in our worship, whenever Hillary was leading us and we were talking about Jesus be the center when we're giving glory to him. And I, I just felt like one of those moments where we just need to stop. And some of us did. Some of us knelt down. Some of us closed our eyes. We responded in the way that we thought fit. But there are moments like that where we actually can tangibly and in some degree sense that God is here. But the two can exist together. If we're always looking to feel something, then that's not great. But if we never feel anything, that's not great either. So when you come to church, come with the knowledge of the truth that God is here, whether you feel it or not. And go in the reality that God goes with you, whether you feel it or not. Because it's the truth that changes everything, not how we actually feel about that thing. We must make sure that we as people walk by faith. I would encourage you when you come to church next week, come to meet with God because God is here. Now, can I share another thing with you? I've only got two points, so I want to bring it into this point now. Something that is even more remarkable than the fact that God wants to be here when we dwell is that the fact that God wants to dwell in us. Now, this is the next, the next truth that I want to talk to you about this morning. God wants to be here. He wants to be near. He wants to dwell in the midst of us, but He actually wants to dwell in us, inside in these bodies, in who we are. He wants to dwell there. Go to 1 Corinthians 6, if you would, please. Are you still with me? Yeah. Got no cheers. Jonah cheered when he was going out to... Um, I don't, I, I'm not going on my feelings, so don't worry about it. First, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. <clears throat> Paul is talking to the same church, the same group of people, and this time he's going to talk about individually what this means for them as individuals. And again, he starts off with a bit of a negative um, aspect of this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, go over, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians 6, verses 14. We're going to read a couple of verses from there. <coughs> and he's talking about partnership He's talking about um, being connected with people in business deals or living your life with somebody. And this is what he's talking about. Do not be yoked together or united together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That's another name for Satan. 
or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between um, the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. These two instances that we find in Corinthians, the same letter that we were looking at earlier, where Paul talked about the people gathered, made up the dwelling of God. He's now making it an individual thing that you yourself as an individual are the temple of God. Now, this is, this is one of those truths in Scripture that just, do you know where you're scratching going, are you sure? You sure? Is that, is that right? Is this the right translation of what it's saying? Folks, this is what it says. This is what it says. You are the temple of the living God. Now, the Greek word for temple in these two passages is a Greek word, not hos. And what that word means is that this is literally in the Old Testament tabernacles where you had the outer courts and then you had the courts of the sacrifices, and then you had that very unique spot in those temples where God's presence actually dwelt. So the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, where it was in those tabernacles and temples, this word is that same word, nahos. This is the Greek word that Paul is using. So he is saying that you, as an individual, you carry and house the very presence and essence of the living God. So it's not the outer court, where all the stuff takes place. It's not even the inner court. It's actually the holy of holies, that that's who you are as a believer. In this Corinthian context, the, this reality, this truth that he's bringing is being used by Paul to encourage the believers to live holy lives, to live right as a result of who they are. He's using it to challenge wrong behavior. I'm going to do the same for just a second. I want to encourage you when you face temptation, when you face giving in to something that seems attractive, when you feel like putting a, a different digit on your tax return, when you feel like telling that lie that's going to get you out of a bit of, difficult, a bit of difficulty, I want you to remember who you are as a child of God. I want you to remember that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you're sitting watching TV late at night, when you're flicking through channels that you know you shouldn't be, and when you're thinking in your head, I know this isn't right, I want you to bring to your remembrance that you, as an individual, are the very temple of God himself. It's one of the greatest motivators for holy living that we have, our identity in him our identity in him, not to, not to gain his approval by doing the right thing, but actually walking in the truth of who we are. Because see, then all that other stuff seems worthless. It seems pale in comparison to the glory of who we are in him, that we are in Christ. We need to grow in holiness. We need to grow in right living. And how we're going to do that is living out of the reality of who we are, but there's more than just right behavior. There's more than just right belief. There's the power to change living within you. There's the power to overcome, to endure, to get up again, to speak wisdom, to believe truth, to be healed, and to bring healing to others. Why? Because God dwells in you, and you're God's temple. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and created the world is in here. Do you believe that? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm thinking, oh, I'm not too sure. But that's what it says. That's what the truth is. We're presently in a context where we said last week, where the select special few do ministry. And only the really special ones um, really know God. Only the really special ones can really hear God. That's not the truth, by the way. That's me saying the way we think often. And we also think that only the select few are really empowered by God. And we Pentecostals, again, I'm giving us a hammer in this morning, we don't really help with this because often we measure spirituality by how many dramatic experiences a person has had. Like if someone came in this morning and said they had a trip to heaven, met all the saints, 
told Abraham they liked his style um, and told Jesus this and that and had this really conversation. We would have that person up the front the next week because we'd go there really, really spiritual. In doing this, what we do is we create a culture of superstition and mysticism and non-reality where those of us who have not had those weird experiences, we feel like second-class citizens. That's really only for the really spiritual ones, but that could not be for me. We create that culture. And I know that because I've been in that culture. I know exactly what that feels like. Can I say something to you that I believe with all my heart? Every single one of us, New Testament, blood-bought children of God, has the life and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Whether we believe it or feel it or not, that is the reality of what the truth of God says. You have what you need for where God has you now. You have what you need. We would not be able to do anything if it wasn't for Him in our lives. Few of us have, would have made it through the last week if the Holy Spirit wasn't there. Some of us would not be here this morning if He didn't help us along. And we wouldn't be God's children if we did not have His Spirit. Now, do we need to walk in daily dependence upon His power and His leading? Yes. Do we long to have Him to have more free course in our lives on a daily basis and overflow? Yes. Do we want to decrease so that He can increase? Yes. Do we want to be continually walking in a fresh relationship with Him and experiencing Him? Yes. Do we desire to know times where we are overwhelmed with His presence, where we walk in new power when we get up from those places? Yes, yes, yes. All these things are true. But this morning I want to emphasize to you, there are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. There are no many Holy Spirits for those of us who don't feel very spiritual. It's the same God, it's the same power that lives in me as any of the rest of us. Father God wants you to know that you're the temple of the Spirit. You are the dwelling place of God himself. Why am I saying all this? Why am I saying that to you? That your life in the Spirit, this is why I'm saying it, that your life in the Spirit, in his power, in his goodness, in his grace, in his intimacy, in all of the good things that come with that, it doesn't start when you go to some special conference or when you attend some series of meetings. It doesn't start when you beg and plead and work yourself into a frenzy. It doesn't start when some preacher with a white jacket pushes you to the floor with a sweaty hand. It doesn't start when your favorite worship leader does your favorite songs and the service is just the way you like it. Your life in the Spirit of God has already begun. The rivers of living water that Jesus promised is already flowing from your life. Maybe a trickle. There may be things that are up the stream that need to be removed, but it's already flowing today. The dunamis, which is the Greek word for this power, the dynamite power of God that enables you to live right, to be effective where you are, to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil is already resident in you. We don't have that excuse. We can't say, oh, I, I just can't do this. Folks, we can never do it, but he can and he is already there. We put our faith in him. He is already resident in you. Now, we have to make the decision, how much of this truth are we going to walk in? We have to make that decision. That's something that we do. He's already there. He's already equipped us and enabled us to overcome the world of flesh and the devil. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's already there. We are children of God. We're, we can cry, Abba, Father, because his spirit is in us. All this is true but we have to make a decision. Are we going to walk in the light of that or in the truth of that? Or are we going to reject that? Are we going to live like, as Paul puts it, mere humans? Mere humans, I love that phrase. Are we going to walk like that? With our heads down, defeat after defeat after defeat? Or are we going to say, I'm a child of God, and because of the power of God that lives within me, I can, go, I can get through this? Not that I'm, it's going to all be brilliant, but actually, I'm going to be able to get through. I'm going to walk this. I'm going to walk through grief. I'm going to be comforted. I'm going to have wisdom to raise my children. I'm going to walk through this sickness. 
And I'm going to walk to the other side, whatever it looks like, because he lives in me. That's a challenge, but hopefully it brings you comfort. I'm convinced, folks, if we grasp this truth, it would make us free. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this is one of the, those big truths that I think as the church we need to rediscover. We need to walk in, and we need to live in. We need to thank God for. Later on in the, the year, we're going to look at some of this in a bit more detail. We're even going to run a course on a Saturday morning that we're going to have a chat about this and, and, and some of the intricacies of this to encourage you as the people of God to walk in the life of the Spirit. But hopefully my heart, and you've heard my heart this morning, this stuff is not um, away somewhere out in the distance that we need some um, guru to tell us all the secrets about all this stuff. This is the reality for who we are as the people of God. See, the life in the Spirit is the normal Christian life. That's, we can't have a Christian life without the new birth and the Spirit of God. There is no life outside of that reality. So what we want to do is just talk about this stuff more, and we won't have, I promise you, any white suit wearing, sweaty hand people who are going to come and make it all about the drama. That's not what I desire, not what I want. I want the people of God to walk in the truth of who they are. And that's our heart, and that's our desire. Yeah, that'll do us for this morning, I think. Let me just pray with you, and then we're closed. And um, Yeah. God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, no matter how we feel, no matter the seasons of, the li of life that we go through, no matter even the environments that we've been brought up in where we've got a bit of a distorted picture of this stuff, I thank you that your truth brings life and it brings liberty and it enables us to walk into more of who you are. Lord, I pray that today we would um, take, this, take your word to our hearts, that when we gather together, we are the dwelling place of God. And Lord, when we go, every single one of us, jars of clay as we are, we carry within us the treasure and the person of Almighty God. And that means where we go in our families, in our workplaces, in the situations that seem hopeless, Lord, we go with salt and light because you go in us. Enable us to walk in this this week. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.